Good morning, Astronomy 1020. Welcome to our fifth lecture week, where we are going to continue to learn about light and um, how matter interacts with radiation. Obviously, if you want to study the stars, you can only study them through light. So mastering your knowledge of photons in the electromagnetic spectrum will be very important. Uh, when we last left off, we learned that light is an electromagnetic wave. So let's start there. Uh, <laughs> pardon me for one second, students. Apologies, my kettle was whistling. Okay, light is an electromagnetic wave. And let's look once again at our diagram of an electromagnetic wave so that you guys can remember how this works. Uh, when you study light for the first time in a physics course, you're usually shown a picture that looks a little something like 25 here. You see a oscillating electric and magnetic field the two fields are perpendicular to each other. And I believe, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe I gave you some notes on this last time. I told you that the electric field was associated with static charge, whereas a magnetic field is associated with moving charge. As time goes on in this class, I'm gonna try to teach you more about electric and magnetic fields. Um, they're an important part of physics and an important part of nature. This is a cartoon model, which shows the electric field is kind of a, a sort of blue wave and the magnetic field is a sort of red wave. Maybe I could show you guys a different model to help you understand what these fields are before we get started here. Um, I've got these cute little physics Java apps uh, in my S drive. And they made one for a radiating charge that I'd like to show you. This is an important picture Oh, shoot. Uh, hold on, I've got a, how do I unblock this? Manage this, can I? Uh, hold on, let's get you guys out of here, you're in my way. Allow. Uh, I used this last semester, fudge. Flash. No, I don't ask. Sorry, guys. I'm not sure. Let me try refreshing this. Allow it. Yes. Yes. Okay. I can't believe I actually made that work. That's really incredible. Okay. What you see here, uh, in uh, if you guys can see my screen, is you should see a proton or some type of charged particle. And the, the charged particle, the proton, is surrounded by an electric field. What is that electric field? Well, you got a minute? I would say for starters that the electric field is the essence of charginess associated with your proton, okay? If you've ever taken uh, two bar magnets, which I have over here somewhere, And if you've ever held up those, those magnets against each other, you've gotten a sense of this field when you, when you feel the magnetic field between two um, North Pole magnets. You can feel that invisible force barrier between the two. There's something that's reaching out and interacting with the two magnets. Now, with bar magnets like the type that you stick to your refrigerator, you're interacting with the magnetic field. But the electric field is not only quite similar, it's intimately related to the magnetic field. They're two expressions of the same force. So for now, you guys can just imagine that it's very similar to that, that magnetic field you feel between two magnets. And this essence of charginess surrounds your proton. This field is not light. 
this field is just a it's a it's a manifestation of the electromagnetic force but what happens is if you take this charged particle and you give it an oscillation or a little wiggle you can create ripples in the field like you see me doing here and this is what light is light is a wave of electromagnetic energy it's oscillations of an electric and or a magnetic field. Now, we can make them chaotic by wiggling this proton around in any direction, or we can make them sort of, um, I don't know if I want to say harmonic, or we can make them uniform. I'm going to click on my sinusoidal oscillation. I'm going to bring my amplitude down a bit and my frequency up. The frequency of the wave is the number of oscillations per second of your little proton. If you wiggle your proton 50 times per second, then the frequency of the wave will also be 50 times per second or 50 wavelengths per second, otherwise known as 50. I wonder if there's any intelligent students out there who remember what the units of frequency are. I don't suppose I could ask that much today, could I? For someone to know what the units of frequency are. Would that, Elijah, would I be pushing the boundaries there? Oh, uh, I can I guess check. you could look at your notebook, right? If your brain can't remember, then I guess your notebook's gonna have to. Let's see, it's... Um... What are the units of frequency? Should we take this as a note again? Doesn't it hurt? Wow, oh. nice, nicely done, Caitlin. I was, I'm impressed you missed our lectures because you were sick and you still know it hurts. Very good. Okay. I watched them still. You did watch them? I saw that you got your homework done and I was very happy with you. That's nice. Okay, so way to go, Caitlin. Way to show these guys what's up. That's right, 50 hertz. Maybe this is not like a small thing. This is a big thing. Hold on. Let me stop my charge here. Oop. Okay. Um, waves have a number of properties associated with them. And I did go over them at the end of last lecture, but you guys were probably exhausted and tired by that point. So I don't think it would hurt to cover them again, okay? So if light is an electromagnetic wave, it has the properties that all waves have. What are some properties of waves? Well, let's make a drawing of a wave. A wave is like, uh, it's a mathematical function. If you ever had to take a trigonometry class, you might have learned about sines and cosines. Those are the mathematical functions that describe oscillations, okay? So here's a drawing of a wave. A wave travels through space. It has undulations. A wave is actually sort of some traveling energy, okay? And usually the wave has some type of medium, but not always. Um, the wave has a repeating cycle which is known as the wavelength of the wave. And we use the Greek letter lambda to represent wavelength. It's the distance, oops, sorry, I'm shaking my laptop here. Um, it is the, let me futz with this for a second. Okay. The wavelength is the distance from crest to crest of your wave, or even the distance from trough to trough. And that's this symbol here, this is wavelength. I'd like to point out to the class that wavelength is a real physical length. Because even though electromagnetic waves are invisible, there is a distance from crest to crest of your wave. So usually we uh, measure wavelength. The standard units are, of course, meters. Um, we're going to be using MKS. But we can also use a couple of other units that will show up in today's lab. Um, one of those units is called the nanometer. Nano means one billionth. So a nanometer is a billionth or one times 10 to the minus nine meters. Nanometers are a good unit to use for wavelength of light because visible light uh, spans a range of 400 to 700 nanometers. So the light that your eyeballs can detect is measured in the hundreds of nanometers. Um, for certain applications in, in astronomy, there's another related unit that, that's going to pop up today in our lab. 
it's known as the angstrom. And this one is a little more esoteric. An angstrom has the symbol one with an A, and then you put a little circle over the top of it. An angstrom is a 10 billionth of a meter. So one times 10 to the minus 10 meters. These are units that are frequently used in a science called spectroscopy, which I need to teach you about today. Um, in other words, one uh, nanometer is 10 angstroms, okay? Write all that down, that's kind of important. Okay. Wavelength is one of the properties of a wave. So we'll put a star next to that. Another property of waves is the frequency. And F, the frequency, I told you before, are the number of cycles per second of your wave. This is all just kind of like a review of what we learned last time, but I'm gonna drill it in a little, a little extra hard. Um, and cycles is not a physical measurable unit the way seconds are. Do you see why I put quotes around cycles? Cycles are like a concept rather than a measurable MKS quantity. So the real units of frequency are a little bit awkward. They are per seconds or one over seconds. That's not the same thing as seconds. That is inverted time. You should probably think of it as cycles per second. Because one over seconds is kind of awkward, we've reinvented that unit as the Hertz in honor of Heinrich Hertz, who did much investigation into electromagnetic radiation. So this, this is defined as one Hertz. And, and Caitlin reminded us of this. Another key property that light has associated with it is, is it has energy. And we talked about that as well. And the energy can either be measured in joules or, uh, or in electron volts, where 1 EV is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. These are all notes I gave you last time, but I kind of wanted to start off there as a way of refreshing yourself, especially because only one of you could correctly answer the units of frequency. I'm just gonna give you a second because I need to erase this. I'd like to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. The friend of mine is known as the electromagnetic spectrum. I think it's 68 or somewhere around here. There we go. The electromagnetic spectrum is the totality of all the types of light that are known to nature. Your eyeballs are sensitive to a pitifully narrow range of electromagnetic radiation from 400 nanometers, which you call purple, up to 700 nanometer wavelength, which you call red. That is to say, what you perceive with your eyes as color is actually the wavelength or the frequency of the wave. The first person to do experiments with light was none other than Sir Isaac Newton. And he took a prism, which is a uh, triangular piece of glass, and he performed an experiment that went something like this. Slide 18. <clears throat> he took a beam of white light and he passed the white light through a prism and he discovered that he could break that white light apart into some component wavelengths. In other words, he could create a rainbow from a beam of white light. Uh, this is a demo that I used to love to do for my students, but I don't have the proper setup here. I have the prism. And I, I, at some point today, I'm gonna actually do this during our lab, but I do have a prism somewhere. Let's just do a little show and tell here. Prism is just a, it's just a triangular piece of glass. I wonder, you know, I'm, get, I'm feeling a little kooky right now. I wonder if I could 
create a rainbow. I just had an idea and shine it towards the class. Okay. I'm not going to go too nuts on this, but maybe I'll give it a shot. Okay, let's So you actually need to collimate the beam of light, and I don't have the, the proper setup to do that. But I'm going to give it a shot. I'm, ooh, yeah. What I'm hoping to do is to be able to shine a rainbow right towards, right towards the camera. But I, I don't think it's going to work unless I collimate this beam of light. Yeah. Well. I'll show you later on today with my spectroscope. We will do this. We will do this experiment before the day is over. But um, the reason why Newton could do it and I couldn't is because actually this worked good in our classroom. <laughs> yeah, you almost saw. I thought I saw it there for a second, Cameron. But I, the thing is, I'm going to have to set it up so during our tea break today, I'm going to be running around my apartment trying to get all the stuff together. I was running behind today. In order to make the experiment work. You can't just have a light bulb shining light in all directions. You have to do what is called collimating the beam. That is, you have to transform the beam into a pencil thin strip so that the light hits at one specific angle. The problem with what I was just doing with the, with the bulb shining in all directions is when the bulb shines in all directions, there are rays of light striking the glass at every which angle. So you don't get a nice neat collimated rainbow coming out of it. It's a little complicated to explain. Um, but in any case, the only point that I'm trying to make is that when you take white light and you separate it into its colors, you are creating something called a spectrum. Okay. So here's your $10 vocabulary word for the day. A spectrum is when you break light apart into its component wavelengths or its component colors. They're the same thing. For instance, when electromagnetic radiation is at 400 nanometer wavelength, you perceive it as violet. When electromagnetic radiation is at 700 nanometer wavelength, you perceive it as red. And green is usually somewhere between five and five, 500 and 550 nanometers, okay? We'll take a, a note on this in a second. But the point that I'm trying to make is whereas Isaac Newton discovered that there was a rainbow, a visible continuous spectrum, Later investigations into light demonstrated that there were other types of light besides the type that your eyeballs can see. The only thing that makes one type of light different than another, oops, sorry, uh, 82, nuts. The only thing that makes one type of light different than another type of light is the wavelength. That is the distance from crest to crest of your electromagnetic wave, okay? For instance, if you go longer than red wavelengths at 700 nanometers, you enter the infrared regime. Or at very long wavelengths, there are light is known as radio waves. You may have thought that radio waves were sounds that you tune into on in your car, but you're actually tuning into light when you tune into radio waves. The light is then converted into sound. On the short end of the spectrum, we have ultraviolet light, which gives you a sunburn, X-rays, which come from nuclear reactions, and the very deadly gamma rays, which come from nuclear reactions as well. Because this is an important point, I think we ought to take some notes on it. So let's take a, make a diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum. These, these zones are sometimes called the regimes of the electromagnetic spectrum. A regime is like a territory or an area. The one that is most important to you because you use it every day is the visible regime sometimes known to astronomers as the optical regime. 
visible goes from, uh, let's see what I got for colors here today. I think I have a purple somewhere. Yeah. It goes from 400 nanometers on the left to 700 nanometers on the right, okay? Um, I'd like to point something out. I realized that in my previous lectures, like my lectures this summer, I sort of took my time and I, I did manage to break that rainbow up. I wonder if I could, what did I do with my prism here? Well, if I was a better teacher, I would have stayed up all night setting up that demo. The order of the colors when you separate them into their component wavelengths is always the same. And I want you guys to look at that for a second. Okay, that's slide 63. I thought it was 83. Um, usually when you, when you break light apart into its component colors, you can, you can arrange it in two ways. If you hold the prism in one direction, you will get purple on the left. And if you flip the prism and hold it in the other direction, you'll get red on the left. Um, oops, sorry. I like to display it this way with the shorter wavelengths on the left and the longer wavelengths on the right. But oftentimes people will flip this. The order of the colors if you do red first is always the same. It goes red, orange, yellow, green, this is the color that Newton would have referred to as blue. In Isaac Newton's day, blue was exclusively used to refer to cyan or sky blue. This color here, which we unimaginatively call dark blue, that color was known as indigo. And I have a personal crusade to bring back the color indigo. I think that's nice. And then of course, violet. So let's look at the order of the colors here in reverse. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And engineers have remembered the order of the colors using the mnemonic device, Roy G. Biv. That's how they refer to it, Roy G. Biv. Um, since I like to put purple on the left, I, I personally like to think of it as vib g your, but that's less popular. But let's write that down here. So we have violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. Those are the colors of the visible spectrum. What, did you learn that in third grade, Wyatt? You learned that in third grade? Damn. Well, your third grade was cooler than my third grade because I didn't learn no Roy G. Biv until I got to college. So I don't know what people told you that indigo wasn't in the rainbow. Not cool. Um, I would like to direct your attention, a quick diversion here. Um, there is a really beautiful uh, Wikipedia page just dedicated to the history of the color indigo. And um, they talk about how it was made using uh, various dyes and things. And I don't know, there's just, wait, no, I want the color. What? There we go. Yeah, this is the Wikipedia page for indigo. So they have uh, indigo plant dye from India. Anyways, they talk about the history of indigo. It's definitely a color, okay? Purple, yeah. purple is really cool too, the history of purple, because that comes from uh, snails. They had to get it from snails and it was really expensive to get. So that's why only kings and stuff used it. So purple was associated with royalty for the longest time. I've heard that as well. Yeah, that's interesting, right? It's funny that a color just because of its exclusive, well, I guess it makes sense. It's the same way we worship gold and all kinds of things like that. If it's rare, it's more special. Nobody likes the pigeon, you know, that's how it works. Um, anyways. Pigeons are incredible. I think pigeons are really they, they are one of the few birds that produce milk. 
I did not know that. Yep, pigeons produce milk. Never trust a pigeon. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know why I even brought that up. You know, I <laughs> I watched some baby pigeons hatch one day in a tree outside my window, and I one of the brothers got pushed out. That often happens. And I helped the baby pigeon get back to the nest. I put like a board between my window and, and the, the branch and, and he hopped across the board a few stories up. It was really, it was a magical moment in my life. <laughs> um, okay, so what about other types of light besides the visible spectrum? Um, at long, by the way, so what we're plotting here is we're plotting wavelength in nanometers and uh, longer wavelengths will be to the right and shorter wavelengths will be to the left. So after the visible, uh, sorry, after red, we have the infrared regime, right? This is IR. Infrared starts around 700 or 1,000 uh, nanometers, and it goes all the way up to roughly one millimeter or so. Here's a challenge question for students. How many millimeters, I'm sorry, if I have one millimeter, how many nanometers is that? I challenge you while I'm talking to see if you can work that out on a piece of paper. How many nanometers does one millimeter equal? I bet you none of you can do it. It's impossible, you'll never figure it out. Okay, so then after one millimeter, we have very long wavelength uh, radiation called radio waves. At the shorter end of the spectrum, shorter than violet, we have ultraviolet or UV, the UV spectrum drops off somewhere around 10 nanometers. Then we have uh, X-rays, very short wavelengths. Uh, they, they end around a hundredth of a nanometer. And then the extremely short wavelength, extremely high energy gamma rays, where I've used the Greek letter for gamma the little curvy Y. You might want to write down gamma if you if you didn't know that. Okay, this is the gamma ray spectrum. Um, there is a relationship between the three variables: wavelength, frequency, and energy. And they're expressed by three formulas that you learned for your office hours last time. The speed of light is equal to the wavelength of light times its frequency. All right. I call that formula number one. The energy of a photon is Planck's constant times its frequency. I call that equation number two. And there's a third formula which mixes these two. The energy of a photon is Planck's constant times the frequency divided by a wavelength. I call that formula number three. Let's write this down again in our notes because we're going to want to use this today several times. Uh, remember that C and H are constants of nature. The speed of light in a vacuum, C is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. That's the speed of light, okay? And Planck's constant a number associated with quantum mechanics is seven times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. Why don't you guys write all that down while I get a cup of coffee? I was fiending for a little more caffeine. Okay, in a moment, we're going to try yet another sample problem with this. Um, is anyone still copying? All right, I'm erasing. Let's learn. Ooh, sorry. Somehow. 
Where is everyone? What? Austin? What is going on here? What? What just happened? Austin? Kim? I'm very, very confused. Can anyone hear me? Can yeah, now. Wyatt, what happened? I turned my back and everybody was gone. Yeah, I think the I think it shut down because I got disconnected. I had to rejoin. Wait, why did it shut down? I'm not sure. I mean, it just said connecting, so I wonder if maybe like. Wait, you were there before, right? Were you there I was, just? In... Yeah. Did I, I didn't hit a button or anything, right? I just like turned I don't around. Think so. No, you were racing, I believe, when it happened. What the hell? I don't think you did it. I think it just happened. I sure hope, it looks like my recording is still going. That is really weird. I hope that, Wyatt, we have to tell the rest of the class to rejoin here. So, yeah. uh, but you know what's weird, Wyatt? Yeah. It, it, it reactivated my waiting room. It was as if like I got really? logged to a different thing. Like the call, just, like the whole thing just restarted. Yeah, it was like the whole thing just restarted, but I don't think, you know, my mouse has like a really sensitive center button, but I don't think that I hit anything because you said I was erasing. I wasn't touching the mouse. Yeah, you were erasing last time I saw. Okay, uh, let me get, geez, man, this, something weird happened to me yesterday too. This is really awful. Uh, wait a minute. Now I can't seem to get, oh, stop the share, that's why. I need to, I need to invite the students again. Well, you and Cam and Austin seem to have joined right away, but. Yeah. I, guess... I don't know why nobody else has. I wonder if they can. All right, well, I need to try to send them an email to find out what's going on. I do not have time for this crap today because we have a lot to cover. And this day is going to get messed up really quick if I don't. Uh, I hate how it includes all this stuff now. Come on. Okay. Um, it's the same, is it the same one as before? Wait. Uh, the same, like, uh, code? Yeah. Yeah, it was the same code. H how did you get back in? Did you have to go and, like, look up the link again? Or, or did yeah, it just... Yeah, I went, I went back to announcements and I just clicked on the link again. Okay, so you, right back to you had to do that to get back, to get back in. Yeah, but... I can imagine that people are okay. So when it first disconnects, it has like a little box that says connecting. So I wonder if maybe they're all waiting on that. Yeah, I, I just know what... it took it took. Yeah, it was taking too long, so I just clicked out of that and just restarted the whole thing. Hopefully, they'll get that email. All right, so you were smart about it. Cam, can you hear me? Can someone else? Austin, Cameron, can you like wake up out of your bed and like tell me what's going on on your end? Because I need to know how to advise students. All right, here comes someone. It's taking a really long time for everyone to get back in here. I'm going to pause the... Okay. Hey, Elijah, do you know what happened? Here comes everyone. I turned around. I like... I turned my back. And then I went like this. 
and everybody was gone except for me. It was like something out of Poltergeist. I don't understand what happened. It's almost comical. Yeah, no, it was actually kind of scary. I thought I did something wrong. <laughs> okay, here, everyone's coming back to me here. Yeah, I think it, it might, must have been on like the Zoom side of things, like a server. Type yeah, it, it must have been. Hi. Guys, I'm so sorry. One moment, I was talking to a full class, and then I turned my back, I erased the board, and I looked back, and everybody was gone except for me. And I, I did like this. I was, I was very confused for a second. I thought maybe I had hit a button or I had ended the call, but it still says it's recording, so the people watching this later are going to be really irritated with, with the last five minutes here. Okay, you were just chilling. But, no, but like... Why did it take so long for everyone to come back to me? I want to know what happened there. I'm very confused. I think we thought you got like disconnected and then you were going to join back. But yeah, I, so it, it seemed like we were both on different. So you were still on a Zoom meeting and we got kicked to a different Zoom meeting. So it was like basically two Zoom meetings going at, at the same time. But huh. I think I kept my same number because Wyatt, Wyatt was clever and he figured this out right away so he left the other one and went back to the link and clicked it again and then Wyatt joined me and it was just like me and Wyatt there for a minute. Yeah the dimensions split that's exactly what happened. We had an alternate okay. universe. I think it's the pigeons they don't want us to know about this information. As soon as we started talking yeah, about pigeons. Yeah we were talking too much about the pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> okay guys. I told you they're scary birds. <laughs> The last equation, um, uh, Emily J, the last equation, you mean <laughs> equals wavelength times this? I hadn't put the a new seven equation. seven times 10 to the negative 34th, I think. Oh, that's not an equation. That's a constant of nature. Do you mean no, um, the h, oh. h equals seven times 10 to the negative 14th. What was that? Like that, That's not an equation. That's a constant of nature, right? Planck's constant, h equals seven. Do you mean this one? It's, it's by the way, it's, yeah. not 14, it's not 14, it's negative 34. Oh, okay. It like cut out so I couldn't see. Okay, so I bet my internet went, went stupid for a second. You know what, the Cox guys are out there every day messing around with stuff. Actually, they called me today, so they're probably mad that I haven't paid my bill or something. I, I don't know what's going on. Hopefully that won't happen again. Emily, that's not an equation. No, I'm not in on it. <laughs> This is a yeah, constant, just... a constant of nature known as Planck's constant. All right, is that what you were looking for, Emily? Okay. So we need to learn a little bit about where Planck's constant comes from and where light comes from. There are two ways for us to think about light. When light is a continuous wave, um, then it has this kind of a form. We could call this uh, a continuous train of light, a wave of light. Sometimes they call it a ray of light. But at the smallest scale or at the fundamental scale, light is actually composed of individual chunks called photons. So a photon, which you might think of as a localized wave packet, a photon is kind of like a, uh, I don't wanna use the word tiny because not all photons are tiny. I want to say it's a packet, or we might even say a particle of light. A, a photon is a little piece of light, okay? We say that light is made up of individual photons. And uh, photons exhibit something in physics known as wave-particle duality. Wave-particle duality is a concept in modern, modern physics where something, sometimes it acts in a particle-like way, sometimes it acts like a wave-like way. You might wonder why we need to distinguish between those two things, and I'll tell you why. When you have things like these little moon balls here, the little moon balls are clearly particles. They have two zones. There is the stuff, and there is the stuff that's not the stuff. In other words, Here's the particle, and everything that's not part of this little ball is not part of the particle. 
And another thing that distinguishes particles is they act like dumb BBs. When one particle hits another, boop, they kind of bounce off each other and scatter away. Waves do not exhibit this property. Waves exhibit a property called superposition. And that means waves can kind of add and subtract the way that numbers can add and subtract. For instance, um, although the demonstration is a little tough to do right here in F5 and slide 40, um, when you make waves on a string, if you have a crest shown here and it travels towards a trough shown here, at the moment the crest and the trough overlap in space, they kind of add and subtract like numbers and they cancel each other out in something called destructive interference. On the other hand, if I have a pulse wave and I send it on a collision course with another pulse wave, at the moment they overlap, they exhibit constructive interference and they add together to make a bigger wave, okay? That's what makes waves different than particles. They're ghost-like and they can overlap and add and subtract. I cannot add these two particles together to make a bigger particle or it's not natural for that to happen, right? They don't, they don't wanna occupy the same space. Unfortunately, whereas we used to believe that some things are waves and some things are particles, a deeper investigation into nature has taught us that most matter and most light exhibit aspects of both at tiny little fundamental scales. And that's caused us to adopt this concept called wave particle duality. Another way to say this is shit's weird, bro. Okay, we don't fully understand how things work at a fundamental tiny level. Um, photons, these little packets of light, they come from atoms. So let's go ahead and draw a picture of a hydrogen atom and let's take a look at how a photon, we talked about baby pigeons today. Now it's time to talk about baby photons. How's a baby photon born? Let's talk about atomic transitions. Um, photons are born inside atoms. And probably a good place for us to start would be to draw a hydrogen atom. Does anyone out there remember what the composition of hydrogen is? Because I would consider that to be a testable thing. Yes, Wyatt, we are going to cover all of that and more. Um, What's the composition of a hydrogen atom look like? Um, Wyatt, that's deuterium. How about a protium atom? Deuterium is hydrogen, so he wasn't wrong. A simpler hydrogen atom is one proton, one electron. Very good, Wyatt. So let's draw that here. So here's my proton and here's my electron. And my electron is orbiting around the proton at a very particular distance. Sometimes we refer to this distance as the Bohr radius. Um, other times we just call it sort of the default orbit or what's known as the ground state. The ground state is the sort of fundamental orbit that an electron has when it's orbiting a proton in a hydrogen atom. In the case of hydrogen, I actually know the exact distance. The distance or the radius of the orbit is 0 0.05 nanometers. Class, how many angstroms is that? This is a test of what I taught you a moment ago. How many angstroms is 0 0.05 nanometers? Someone answer me that question. Very good, Wyatt, Point 0.5. The electron likes to orbit at this distance, especially when the atom is cold and low energy. Unlike a planet orbiting the sun, the electron does not get to choose which distance that it wants to orbit the proton. 
all values of distance are not allowed. <clears throat> and that's because <clears throat> we say that the orbits of electrons are quantized. And this is a $10 word, <clears throat> quantized. What does quantized mean? Quantized means discrete. Quantized means choppy. Or in a more modern sense, quantized could even mean pixelated. It is possible if you energize your hydrogen atom, if you add energy to the atom, to get that electron to jump up to another possible orbit. But the next possible orbit lies at a very particular distance from the proton. To distinguish between this orbit and this orbit, we often give the orbits a number called a principal quantum number. The ground state is called the n equals 1 state. And this orbit, which is sometimes called the first excited state, gets the next quantum number, n equals 2. You can think of the n as the number of the orbit. There is a second orbit. And there is a third orbit. And there is a fourth orbit. And there is a fifth orbit. Something funny starts to happen as you jump from, by the way, so I, you guys may have learned this in a chemistry class. It sounds like why it did, but I bet not everyone did. The idea is that the electron can orbit here in the ground state. The electron can orbit here in the first excited state but the electron cannot orbit in between. It does not have a stable orbit in between. And that's not how gravitational orbits work when you deal with planets. Earth, for instance, orbits at 1 AU from the sun, but it could also orbit at 1.1 AU or 1.111 AU or 1.112 AU. The Earth can kind of orbit anywhere it wants from the sun, as long as you have a finger of God strong enough to push it there. On the other hand, the electron does not have that freedom because we are dealing with the tininess of space here. At these fundamental scales, space is not smooth and continuous. It's quantized, it's choppy, it's pixelated. You're coming up against the resolution of space itself. That's a weird idea. Something interesting happens though. As you increase the number of orbits, as you go to the fifth, sixth, and seventh state, the orbits start getting closer and closer and closer together until they almost seem to blend together. Oh, you got a bad lag, Cameron? Does everyone have a bad lag? Is it my internet or is it Cameron's internet? Caitlin and Arunsak are cool. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> The funny thing about this is if you asked me, Brendan, how many orbits are there? I would say there are an infinite number of orbits. But if you said, well, the, does that mean they go on forever? I would say, actually, no. There is a final orbit, even though there's an infinite number of orbits. What? That doesn't sound right. That doesn't seem to make any sense. Well, what happens is, is kind of like this thing called Zeno's paradox. As you get to higher and higher orbits, they start blending together until they become more and more smooth. And if I were to represent this by an energy level diagram, let's grab an energy level diagram here, probably around slide 13. The orbits get closer and closer together and they sort of pig pile on top of each other until you get to the final orbit. Now, although we could measure the distances that the electron travels from the proton in terms of, say, nanometers, the way I originally did, it turns out that a much smarter way to consider orbits of electrons is not in terms of distance, but instead to consider the energy necessary to get the electron to the next orbit. And this energy is the potential energy 
the electrostatic potential energy needed to lift the electron up from one orbit to another orbit. So in other words, if I were to list the energies over here on the side of the board, and I'm going to do these energies in electron volts because it's a more appropriate unit, the energy needed to get an electron from orbit one to orbit two is 10.2 electron volts. Did I do that right? Let's make sure I didn't mess that up. Yes. And the orbit to get from, the energy needed to get from orbit one up to orbit three is 12.1 electron volts. And if we add 12.8 electron volts, we can get it up to the third orbit. There is one last energy stop, sometimes known as the ionization potential of hydrogen. If I give my electron exactly 13.6 electron volts, ionization potential then boop I can kick the electron right off of the atom and fling it into space you could think of 13.6 electron volts is like the escape velocity of the electron that's one way to think about it although it's an energy not a velocity Why am I telling you this? Because you don't always give the electron enough energy to leave the atom. Usually you end up giving it a little bit of energy and it goes up to one of these different orbits and it dangles around and it orbits around at one of these higher orbits, but the electron does not stay happy for very long when it's up here. The electron prefers to be as close to the proton as possible. And so what happens is after a few thousand orbits, the electron gets tired and it will cascade or it will drop down energy level by energy level until it gets back to n equals one. The thing is when it drops from high orbit to low orbit, it needs to release energy. And what form does it take when it releases energy? You might have already guessed it. The energy is released in the form of a photon where the energy of the drop to drop from one orbit to another orbit is exactly equal to the energy of the photon released. These photons are photons of unique energy, wavelength, and frequency. They're sometimes known as emission lines. So I'm going to erase here, and I'm going to walk you through the production of one of our emission lines. It's important. So uh, I have a quick question. Yeah. So at the like farthest um, like uh, electron orbits, can it get, because you said it gets closer and closer together, towards the end, does it get so, do the orbits get so close to each other that the electrons can actually touch? Or like that causes an issue, like where the rings are almost overlapping? Uh, okay, so the electrons won't touch, especially here, Wyatt, in the, in, the, in the situation of a hydrogen atom. Remember that a hydrogen atom is merely one proton and one electron. So there's yeah. no touching other electrons because there's only one electron. Um, you could ask that question with a multi-electron atom, such as helium, but the truth is that the electrons do a good job of keeping far away from each other. You know why? So even, even in atoms that have like a ton of electrons? The electrons hate even... each other. They will okay. do anything to stay away from each other. Okay. One of the rules of quantum mechanics, known as the Pauli exclusion principle, teaches us that no two electrons can have the same quantum state. And that means no two electrons can orbit at the same distance with the same spin. Usually, you might have remembered this from chemistry class, because electrons have a property called spin, and because spin can either be pointed up or down, you get to have two electrons for each orbit. But okay. their spins cannot be the same. A better way to think about that, a simpler way, so that I don't have to teach everyone chemistry and quantum mechanics in 50 seconds, is just to think that electrons do a good job of keeping away from each other because they're negatively charged. That's a okay. simple way to think about it. But it's a cool question. A better way to think why it is as the orbits get closer and closer together, 
it means the electron gets more freedom to kind of do whatever it wants. When the electron is up here, it can kind of orbit at any old distance it wants because there are so many pig piles on top of each oh, other. Oh, yeah. It's when the electron gets down here that you start to really notice that the electron does not have free will, but it's kind of constrained to move on one of these ladder, ladder rungs. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So in order for you to learn a little bit more about this, let's look at a particular transition. Let's imagine that we have an electron here and it's gonna drop down to there and let's investigate it using the tools we've developed so far. In other words, let's do a story called the three to two transition of hydrogen, which is how uh, photons get produced. So this story is called the three to two transition of hydrogen. I'm going to try to do it fast because we lost almost 10 to 15 minutes with that nonsense today. I really didn't have time for that. Um, so at the beginning of our tale, we have a hydrogen atom. A hydrogen atom has one proton in the nucleus and it has one electron. And our electron is not in the n equals one state, nor is it in the n equals two state. But our electron happens to be found right up here in the n equals three state. If you asked me a question like, how did it get up there? I would say, I don't know, maybe it bumped into another atom or something. And the collision energy kicked the electron up there. And that electron has been orbiting up there for a while, probably for about, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 to the minus eight seconds or so. Now, 10 to the minus eight seconds doesn't sound like a lot to you humans. But we ain't talking about humans here. We're talking about electrons. 10 to the minus eight seconds is like a long time for an electron. It could orbit the proton maybe 50,000 times or more in that brief instant of time. And after 10 to the minus eight seconds, the electron has gotten tired. And it's going to drop. And in this case, although it could drop right to n equals one, this particular electron happens to drop to n equals two. That's why we call it the three to two transition of hydrogen, because an electron drops from the third orbit to the second orbit. When it does so, it is going to release a tiny amount of potential energy. And the only way for that energy to be conserved is if the energy is emitted in the form of a microscopic photon, a little particle of light, which has a very unique energy a very unique wavelength, and a very unique frequency. One of the rules that these electrons obey, or these photons obey, is that the energy of the drop is equal to the energy of the photon. And the energy of the drop is the change in energy. The change in energy from the third state to the second state, which we can compute by looking at our energy level diagram. What do we get if we subtract 12.1 minus 10.2 electron volts, students? 12.1 minus 10.2. I'm gonna need my calculator here, hold on. Well, what's the change in energy? Point 0.7? No, it's, did I not have oh. the numbers up long enough? I thought you had oh, I just joined back, so I might just be wrong. Just read it from there. Oh, okay, 1.9. Yeah. It's, it's 1.9 electron volts. It's 12.2 minus 10, sorry, 
12.1 minus 10.2. Um, I'm trying to do something. I think instead of 1.9, I want to use one more significant figure. I think it's 1.85. I think that's what I want. Just a second, students. Oh, I see what's going on. Hold on a second. One point eight nine is what I want. Just short of one point nine. So although you were supposed to get Austin 1.9 from this diagram, this diagram is only good to like three significant figures and I needed just a teensy bit more precision there. Okay, so, so work with me here for a second. Okay, what is our goal? Our goal is to find what is the wavelength and what type of photon is released by the three to two transition of hydrogen. We know the energy of the photon. Let's find the wavelength and the regime of the EM spectrum. Do you guys know how to go about doing that? Class, I thought you guys knew how to convert from energy to wavelength. I thought you had some skills to do that. Now I'm suspecting that you don't know nothing. Uh, can we use the C equals wavelength times frequency? Or uh, the, and, and you could do that, Wyatt, if you had the frequency. But you don't have well, the we can. Oh, yeah. Let's try a different formula. Can we use the third formula we were given? Energy equals H times C over uh, lambda. Excellent. Except modify it. Yeah, how do we modify it? Uh, multiply the lambda to uh, energy. And then we'll divide out the energy and put that under the H times C. Yeah, it's kind of like flipping a burger. We flip this one up and we flip that one down, right? So wavelength is equal to HC over energy. Can we leave the energy in electron volts? Wait, who am I talking to there? Who's that troll? That was me. Who's Paul. me? Paul. Paul oh, G. Paul, Paul G. Okay, sorry. Um, when, when I have it in a certain view, I can't see who's talking mm -hmm. to me. Uh, or I can't, I, it doesn't show me. Paul, yes. Paul, can I use electron volts? No. What do you I have need to do? Convert use? it. Or to use what? dimensional analysis to convert it. Convert it to what? Nanometers, ultimately. Nanometers is a unit of wavelength. But we have an energy here. Okay, Austin. A run sack knows. Paul, it's joules, right? Joules are the MKS unit of energy. Okay, fine. You at least knew we had to convert it to something. So Paul, help me out with this. I'll start off with 1.89 EV and I'll make a division bar. Paul, where are my units? What am I doing here? So your bottom unit will be the EV. Yep. Uh, top unit will be uh, joules or Capital J. Conversion factor. Who's got the conversion factor? I'm gonna have to look that up. 
Yes, you will. Remember, on the test, you'll have to look. Actually, on the test, I'll have a little formula sheet for you. I should probably give that to you guys. I wonder if I could give that to you now. Um, feel free to help Paul out, anyone who knows what the conversion factor is. Uh, so I found that it's 1 EV equals 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Okay, so punch him and crunch him and tell me what you get. Uh, 3.02 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Um, okay, I want 3.03. .03. Somehow I rounded badly. Y your calculation was correct, Paul, but I think I needed 1.895 EV. I forget what, you've got to use just the right number. I'm trying to do something that's a little more precise than average here, Paul, so I'm, I'm fiddling with the numbers. So you're just gonna to have to trust me. It was supposed to be 3.03, .03. okay? Okay, and if, if you wanna be more consistent, you could add a number five there. <clears throat> uh, now let's plug this into our formula, okay? So our wavelength, here we're gonna use a slightly more advanced version of Planck's constant. We're gonna use 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. Usually we just use seven here, but today I'm doing something a little extra. Times the speed of light, which is 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second. And now we're going to divide it by 3.03 .03 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Go ahead and punch that up, guys. What'd you get? Okay. Oh, I'm looking at, I see your little calculators. Yeah. Okay. So someone talked to me. Yep. You guys all have it. I trust you guys can get it now, but now you got to tell me how to round it and how to three sig figs. Um, 6.56 times 10 to the negative seven. What are my units? Yes. Sorry? I heard someone say it, but softly, I think. Uh, meters. Meters. Good. Now, I'm trying to train you guys for the sorts of questions that I'm going to be asking you. Wait, why is everyone, why is everyone trolling all of a sudden? Are we having connection issues? Oh, shit. Oh, right. Hold there. on. I lost everyone Never for mind. a second. It says my internet connection. Yeah, you froze for a minute. Damn, bro. Whoa. I don't know what's going on today. There's some buggy stuff going on out there. It's the pigeons, I tell you. It's all the pigeons. Okay. Yeah, you froze, but I think you're good now. All right. Sorry about that, guys. All right, listen. I'm trying to ask you the kind of question... I'm gonna be asking you on the exam, okay? 
in what regime of the electromagnetic spectrum is a photon with 6.56 times 10 to the minus 7 meters? Let me help by providing you with the electromagnetic spectrum picture. Okay? That's 63. Is it level 1? Level 1 doesn't make any sense. We need Is to understand... Uh, n equals 2? No, no, no. Or no. dimensional analysis? No. You got to convert it to nanometers? All right. Are we in the tech? orange regime? <laughs> okay, all right. Arun Sack and whoever was just talking both said something intelligent. The first two people we have to talk about what you did wrong. When I'm asking, I want to make sure that you guys can understand my words, okay? When I'm asking for a regime of the electromagnetic spectrum, I want to know is it radio waves? Is it infrared? Is it ultraviolet? Is it visible? Is it x rays? Is it gamma rays? Okay? So saying level one or level two didn't make sense. A run sack is making an important point. Most of these wavelengths are in nanometers. So he said we should convert it to nanometers. Good idea. And then some other guy actually had figured out, I think, what regime it was in, although he answered it kind of funny. A run sack, will you talk to me for a second? Could you help me convert that to nanometers? So everyone yeah, sure. So what would I do? Uh, you're going to write out 6.56 times 10 to the negative 7 meters, X bar, M on the bottom, nanometers on the top, and then I got to go find the conversion rate. It's a billion. One oh, um, so you got times 10 to negative 9, yep. Okay, so punch him in, what do you get? On it. Sorry? I'm doing it right now. These two numbers are the same. Whatever, just punch it up. <laughs> oh, you're just going to add them. You're going to uh, 7 plus. It's okay. Just punch it in your calculator. It's 6.56 times 10 to the negative 16. Nope. Nope. Not even close. Okay. This divides by this. Don't multiply them. If that's on the bottom, you've got to divide it. Six hundred and fifty six nanometers. In what regime of the electromagnetic spectrum is six hundred and fifty six nanometers found? Orange. That's not a regime. Visible. Visible light in it is the color orange. Careful. That was made by a crappy weed smoking artist who didn't know what they were doing. This, <laughs> this is the real picture, okay? 656 nanometers corresponds to which color? Red. Wicked, wicked red, okay? That is, uh, that's, let's see. Um, 20, 40, 60, 80. So 656 is right around here. It is a super, super, super red photon. Now, I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine so you can understand what I'm talking about here, OK? Let's go out into outer space. And I want to introduce you to a friend known Professor, as. Professor, I have a question. Yeah. Can you go back to the chart with the visible light and the radio waves and all of that stuff? Yeah. 63. Yeah, so from 0. 0.0001 nanometers to 100 nanometers or 100 meters, is that all light that we can't see? Like that would have That's a right. Color? The only light, your eyeballs, Austin, are sensitive to a pitifully narrow range of electromagnetic radiation from 400 to 700. All That's of this kind of bullshit, no? and all of this is light that we cannot see to answer your question. Is it a different color? You could think of it like that way because clearly wavelength corresponds to color. It's a, you could think of it as a color that we cannot see. That's cool.
Yes, it is cool. Light is cool. Now look, I, first of all, write this down. This is in the visible spectrum and it is a unique red photon, okay? Now, I wanna introduce you to something. I wanna show you where this photon shows up in outer space. In outer space, there is a beautiful nebula known as the Rosette Nebula. It's, it's a location in space where there's a cluster of stars surrounded by some very hot hydrogen gas. And my internet is doing bad today. So, come on, baby. Oh, there we go. Okay. Here we go. So what you're looking at here is a nebula known as the Rosette Nebula. And, and what you're seeing is you're seeing a clump of newborn stars, which are extremely hot, and they pump out a lot of radiation. And that radiation is traveling into the surrounding nebula, and it's heating up the hydrogen gas found there. All of the hydrogen gas in this nebula is becoming heated up by the photons, and the electrons are jumping up to the n equals 3 state and they're dangling around there for about 10 to the minus eight seconds or so. And then when they cascade down, all of those millions and zillions of electrons all start emitting a very pure, very unique red photon. All of the red light that you see coming out of this nebula has an exact wavelength of 656 nanometers. All of this light is caused by the three to two transition of hydrogen. And in that sense, this nebula is kind of like a laser nebula in that it's emitting a very pure, very unique red light. This red light is a unique emission line. It's 656 nanometers. It's so important in astronomy that this photon gets its own nickname. It is known as hydrogen alpha. Hydrogen alpha is one of the most important photons in the electromagnetic spectrum. Well, I don't, that's not true, Wyatt. Uh, Wyatt, I'm afraid I'm going to correct you here. This gas oh. is optically thin. The photon, the, the particle density in this nebula, Wyatt, is so incredibly low that the photons can travel right through the nebula. They do not push the gas. Maybe in some places like the death of stars that happens, but not here. This gas is what's called optically thin. The photons can escape. That's why you can see them, okay? Okay. Um, <clears throat> class, here's another question. Suppose we had done a different transition instead of that one. Suppose instead of the three to two transition, we had considered the two to one transition or the four to two transition. There would have been many different photons that the hydrogen could produce, okay? Let me, rather than make you calculate them all, because that kind of took a long time, let me show you some of the photons that can be produced by hydrogen gas. According to this, the spectrum of hydrogen consists of three photons, a red photon at 656 nanometers, known as hydrogen alpha. Hydrogen alpha is caused by the three to two transition of hydrogen. This photon is a blue photon known as hydrogen beta. Class, which transition is responsible for the production of hydrogen beta? No tricks. Not correct, a run sec. That's not two to one for hydrogen beta. Come on, talk to me. Just look at the uh, diagram. Four to three. Pardon? Uh, four to two. Uh, uh, four to two. 
There's Where also a purple photon at 434 nanometers. That's called hydrogen gamma. So this, this is three to two, four to two. What about hydrogen gamma? Five to two. That's right. These three transitions make up the, the, the spectrum, the emission line spectrum of hydrogen gas, okay? Um, Arunsak mentioned the two to one transition. According to this diagram, the two to one transition makes a photon that's 122 nanometers. Arunsak, in what regime of the electromagnetic spectrum is 122 nanometers found? Um, I guess, I can't see the chart, but I think it was gamma. No, the guess again. One. It's just shorter than, than 400. Just shorter than, visible. No, visible is, it's, it's not in the visible because it's, it's less than 400 nanometers. I can't remember what was in between gamma and visible. You was it x-ray? You can't remember regime? what comes just before violet. Indigo. Oh, oh ultraviolet. Yeah, I could right. That. Okay. So, I got another question for you guys. Where is that spectrum here? What color do you think hydrogen gas would be if you heated it up? If I mix together red and blue and purple, what color will come out? White? No. White is what you get if you mix the entire rainbow. The emission line spectrum is not an entire rainbow. It's a red line, a blue line, and a purple line. Yellow, orange. Green. No. You guys oh, suck at color theory. What color do you get if you mix red and blue? Purple. And what color do you get if you mix purple and purple? Purple. Exactly. Did you say that, Caitlin? I'm sorry. I said green at first. I don't know why, but yeah, I said purple. All right. In other words, when you heat up a hydrogen spectrum tube, as I'm about to do in a moment, you will discover that it glows with a kind of cool, electric, evil purple color. You're gonna be doing this for your lab today, okay? But what's cool about the hydrogen spectrum tube is when you analyze it and you break that light apart using a prism, you discover that that evil purple color is not made from a complete rainbow, but it's made of three lines. A red line caused by the three to two transition, a blue line caused by the four to two transition, and a faint violet line caused by the five to two transition. This type of spectrum is called an emission line spectrum. And each atom in the periodic table of elements produces its own unique emission line spectrum. That's kind of cool because that means we can do this art called spectroscopy, where every element in the periodic table of the elements has a unique emission line spectrum. For instance, hydrogen has a red line and a blue line and a purple line. The element sodium is famous for having a double yellow emission line, and that helps us identify sodium. Helium has a red line and a, green, uh, a yellow line and a couple of greens and a couple of blues. Neon is famous for having a crap load of red emission lines. Every element in the periodic table has a unique emission line spectrum. So what astronomers do to understand the stars is they take starlight, they break it apart into a rainbow or a spectrum, and then depending on which colors they see there, they can identify the chemical compositions of the stars. Yes, Austin, we can find new elements that way. Uh, but today we've discovered most of the elements that exist the only way we can create new elements now is by making heavier and fatter elements. But yes, Austin, originally when the periodic table of elements was patchy and we didn't know about all the elements, that's how we discovered the new ones. 
is we conclusively proved that they had a different emission line spectrum. In fact, science is pretty nutty, Arunsak, and here's what else is cool about it. It's like wizardry. Taking light and breaking apart the light into its component wavelengths, it's kind of like peeking under the covers of atoms. It's looking into the interior machinery of atoms. It goes so much farther, Austin, then, is that how we discovered new elements? You don't realize this, but all of those cool scientists like Niels Bohr, who understood the nature of the atom, they had to do this backwards. They started out with all of the emission line spectra, and from there, they deduced that the electrons had quantum orbits that could only be discrete. They had the, do you think Niels Bohr took out a microscope and could observe an electron flying around a proton? Uh-uh, that ain't how it works. Let me tell you what Niels Bohr did. He did what you're about to do in your lab. He took hydrogen gas, he heated the crap out of it until it glue with electric purple color. Then he discovered that that purple was made of only red, only blue, and only purple. And Niels Bohr scratched his head for a few years saying, what the shit is going on here? Why would hydrogen only produce one red line, one blue line, and one purple line? And what does that mean about the hydrogen atom? And he then went backwards from there, and he realized that the electrons were jumping around inside orbits and that the hydrogen atom looked like this. That was a hard job. That's why Niels Bohr is cool, all right? Yes, science is totally nutty. Okay, let's talk about what we're going to do in our lab today, because I've gone a little bit over uh, trying to compensate for that that glitch that we had. Today's lab is called spectroscopy. We are going to take a 10 minute break or so, at which point I will try to set some things up. Um, we're gonna look at some different elements and I'm gonna hold what's called a spectroscope up to those elements. The spectroscope is basically like a type of prism that will break the light apart into its component wavelengths. And then we are going to use a set of colored pencils to analyze those wavelengths. Now, let me tell you what would be really helpful today. So scrap this up during your tea break. Um, I grabbed these at Job Lot. You don't have time to do that now. But if you have something like this floating around your house, it could be a box of crayons or some magic markers. We're going to want to draw in the different color emission lines today. So having a set of colored pencils would be really helpful. Uh, you might actually be able to do this on the computer using MS Paint as well. So over here, um, let's go to our lab before we take our break here. Let's see if I can hit print on this. The page that you really need, oh, by the way, uh, lab five was supposed to be the inverse square law. I don't know if I called it, I might have to rename these. This is called lab six here. What is it called? in your syllabus. Spectroscopy should be lab five. I was worried that this, this, okay. Lab one, two, three, four. Okay, we did the period of the ISS here. So this is lab five. That's supposed to be period of the International Space Station. That's what we did last time. So uh, I wanna edit this. I just wanna make sure this matches what we're doing. This should be lab number five. Sorry guys, I'm a little messed up today. Okay. For lab five, we need one page out of this in particular, this page, okay. Um, and you might be able to edit it uh, using a computer program or using some color pencils. I'm gonna hit print on this. All right, do we want a tea break before we start the lab? Yeah, everyone likes that. Okay, it's 109, let's give ourselves until 120 and then we'll uh, get started. Sound good? See you guys in a little bit. Hi guys, I'm back and I'm set up. Took me a couple of seconds here. Uh, 
oh, I need one other thing. I need the charger for my phone because I'm going to use that to look through the spectroscope. All right, uh, does everyone have their sheet printed out? The spectroscopy sheet? Will it be a problem if I don't have a printed piece of paper? Well, what's your plan exactly? You have a plan. I can't print right now because I'm out in public. And I'm willing to write everything down, though, if well, that works. When you say out in public, you mean like you're not at home? Not at home, no access to printer. OK, so let's talk about what you could do around sec. You could try to re – you're going to have to reproduce this scale. Did you attempt to do that? I can do that. Can you get on it real quick, like a buddy? Yep. Another option to run sec – is if you have oh yeah that's smart the guy named <laughs> Daniel get the PDF version and use paint yeah facts. yeah that's Daniel thank you that's what I was gonna suggest too if there's a MS Paint program or something uh, where you could just you know draw in colors we're gonna be drawing in emission lines and you could change the color and you could draw in the emission lines at the you know what I mean think you could do something like that all right so there's several different options on how to go about this. <clears throat> so let's remember what the concept is. The concept is that every element on the periodic table produces a unique set of emission lines. And I have a slide that, that demonstrates that here. Sometimes people uh, can represent the periodic table of elements with each element showing its unique emission line spectrum. Our goal is to look at a handful of different elements, hydrogen and helium and mercury and neon, to use a spectroscope to split the beam of light into its component wavelengths, and then to draw the appropriate color at the appropriate wavelength onto our sheet. In addition to this, there are some other types of spectra we wanna look at as well. When you see a spectrum that looks like one of these, these are called emission line spectra. And I didn't quite get to it today, but um, it turns out there are other types of spectra besides emission line spectra that we'd like to look at today. The other two types are called continuous spectra. That's where you get a complete rainbow. And then there's this weird hybrid called an absorption line spectrum. An absorption line spectrum looks like a rainbow but there are key wavelengths that are missing from the spectrum. For instance, here in our hydrogen spectrum, you can see that hydrogen has both an emission line spectra shown on top, an emission line spectrum rather shown on top. And on the bottom, you can see hydrogen in absorption. That's where you get a rainbow and you get unique wavelengths removed from the spectrum. The reason why you can create an absorption spectrum is sometimes white light will shine through a gas and the electrons will actually jump from low orbit up to high orbit and remove photons from the spectrum when they do that. Your goal today is just to look at some different types of spectra and record them, kind of like Niels Bohr did. And then on Thursday's class, we'll try to understand what this is a little better, okay? So <clears throat> let's start by getting my phone on share mode here so that we can set up our lab. Uh-oh. Sometimes the screen mirroring is not good. <clears throat> uh, 
<coughs> Wyatt, are you talking to me <coughs> or everyone else? Shucks. Okay, I'm having some problems. I'm going to have to reboot my phone. Super annoying. Yesterday it worked flawlessly. Here's what you guys can do for me in the meantime, okay? While I'm waiting to reboot my phone. <coughs> uh, let's start by getting our name down. Can you guys see this? Yeah, it's not. It's actually shit school is what it is. Sorry, I shouldn't be saying that. Logitech capture. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to see if I can change my focus here with the, the old Logitech. Okay, there we go. Name, lab number five, okay. Don't forget to put uh, AS 1020. And don't forget to put your section, whatever it is. All right. <clears throat> now, we are going to use a number of different elements. Okay, hold on a sec. I'm going to... I'm going to attempt to activate my phone again. Let's see if I can. Share. Pray to the gods. There we go. <clears throat> Come on, baby. It says it's connecting. Okay, there we go. So let's talk about the gas names that we're gonna look at here. Um, let's see if we can get rid of those TV lines. There we go. Okay, so our first element will be hydrogen. Our second element will be helium. Mercury, neon, um, I'd like to look at an incandescent bulb. And the solar spectrum. That'll probably take us quite a bit of time. So we'll try to get all these if we can. <clears throat> now I want you guys to look at your, your spectrograms here. Notice that your spectrograms run from 4,000 to 7,000. Do you guys remember what units that is here? This is the visible spectrum, but if it's going from 4,000 to 7,000, what units are they using? Nanometers. Nanometers goes from 400 to 700. So this must be a different unit than nanometers. Angstroms, very good, Christopher Leonard. This is using an old fashioned spectroscopy unit called angstroms. The reason that's weird is in our spectroscope, we're actually gonna be looking at nanometers. So you guys can see here, let's try to zoom in. When I look through my spectroscope, you guys can see that inside my spectroscope, it runs from 700. First of all, it's backwards. It's going to go from 400 to 500 to 600 to 700. They're using nanometers and they're backwards. That's okay as long as we make sure to keep our conversion straight, okay? We just have to make sure that we're quantitative and we take down the right number lines. 
Now a spectroscope is a tool that uses a different type of prism or a different technique to break apart light. It uses something called a diffraction grating and you can see a diffraction grating here. I should have actually used this earlier when I was trying to make a rainbow for the class. A diffraction grating is like a film that when you pass light through the film will break uh, light apart into its component colors. Let's see here if we could look at some sunlight with this here. I plug this puppy in. This is the this is the experiment I should have done earlier. Let's see if we can shine a rainbow towards my screen here. Ooh, whoa, trippy. Do you guys see what's going on there? The white light is being broken apart. Now those are different orders or different spectra, but the white light is being broken apart into different rainbows. Um, our spectroscope is designed to just grab one of those rainbows so we can focus on one rainbow and analyze it. Pretty cool, right? Sometimes they make some like trippy glasses out of this stuff and you can go to raves with it or whatever. Okay, so this is called the diffraction grating. Now, <clears throat> our diffraction grating, you can kind of see it right in there. Ooh, I almost got a little glint. Well, light is gonna come in this end. That's, the, that's where the slot is. There's a very thinly collimated slot in there. Let me see if I can illuminate that and shine into it. I don't know if you guys can see that, but in there, there's a pencil thin slot. And when I look through, if I look over on this edge here, you guys can see the white slot over there. That little thin white thing you see is the, is the thin white beam. And the beam kind of comes down the spectroscope. <clears throat> it hits the diffraction grating here, and then it scatters the spectrum onto a piece of film with the wavelengths over there. So I'm gonna kind of zoom in. That way when I look through my spectroscope, I can see the entire spectrum. So this is the, this is the complete continuous spectrum that I can see by looking at a incandescent bulb. This type of bulb that has a filament in it, it's called an incandescent bulb. Maybe we'll actually start by just trying to make the rainbow. Let's see if we can cut down on, the, you know what I need guys? I need a slightly dimmer bulb to make this work. So I, I realized that it's a little too bright. So just hold on for a second. This is a 40 watt incandescent bulb. It should do a little better of a job when, it, when it's time. So I'm gonna leave that to the side. Okay, let's see if we can get um, hydrogen. Here's some hydrogen, this is diatomic hydrogen. Let's put it into our power supply and let's switch it on. And do you see that cool looking electric purple color? That's, that's hydrogen gas being heated up. Let's see if we can use the spectroscope to observe the hydrogen gas. Guys, I want you to know this takes a little bit of work and effort on my part. So you're gonna have to be patient with me. I'm, I'm doing my best to hold the phone and the spectroscope and focus it, um, but it can be a little tricky. So just bear with me because this is not as easy as it looks. Okay, we can, whoop, there's the spectrum right there. Gotcha. Okay, so what do we see? This is a still photo. We can see a red line there, and let's look at the wavelengths. Can you guys see my mouse on the screen? You can see my mouse. Yes, says Caitlin, okay. So Caitlin, where my mouse is right now, that's 600 nanometers, right? And over here is 700 nanometers. So what that means is these bigger tick marks 
they're each 10 nanometers. And do you see these little ones here? Those are five nanometers, okay? So what would you guys say the wavelength of the red emission line is? Talk to me, students. That's a you job. Do I have a better photo of this? Is it 650? It's it's just after 650. 650 one nanometers. Well, hold on. It's somewhere between 650 and 650. Let's let's just let's say it's very close to 655 nanometers. Actually, doesn't this sound familiar? This sounds like something that I that I learned about in my class today. Do you guys know what that is? What is that? Hans, what does the chat say? Someone read the chat for me. I can't look at the chat. Paul says hydrogen alpha. Yes. Paul, Paul G, you are right there with me as usual, pal. That's hydrogen alpha. Okay, so it's time for us to make a hydrogen alpha line. So, hold on guys, I'm trying to balance this. And, all right, so I'm gonna take a really red crayon or a red uh, pencil. There's a nice deep red. And I'm gonna go to hydrogen alpha should be at, uh, uh, sorry. It should be at 655 or 656. So there's 620. That's 640. That's 660. So 655 should be kind of somewhere in there. So I'm going to make a single red emission line. Okay. You guys should do the same. Okay. So what's our next one? <clears throat> our next one is called hydrogen beta. It's a little fuzzy. I could have taken a better picture of it. Yeah. Maybe I could have gotten that a bit clearer. I don't know what you guys, do you, do you know what the wavelength is there? I've got to get the angle just right. Ah. Ooh, my hydrogen is dying. Okay. You almost had it. Do you know what it is, Wyatt? Do you see how it's flickering there? My hydrogen is almost yeah. dead. Uh -oh. Hydrogen burns out really fast. I'm going to have to get a new tube of that. So um, let's just use my photograph. Wyatt, what would you say? Give me your best guess. I know it's a little bit fuzzy. All right, let's see. I would have to say that's like... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I would say that's right on like the 480 line. I agree with you. Nice. Okay. Thing. So um, this color is famously kind of like a tealish aqua color. Um, 480 is kind of, I'm just going to use a kind of cyan blue. Okay. Cyan is a good, is a good description for it. Okay. So... I'm going to go to 480. Okay. And then how about that purple one? Um, two or 462. No, no, that doesn't make sense. Where's my mouse here? How come I could see the mouse before? Oh, there, there it is. Okay, so, hold on. Can you see my little, hey, what's wrong with my stupid thing? Okay, my, everything's dying on me. 
Um, oh, I was getting by twos. Okay. This is and this. I, 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 yeah, it's four thirty-one. Yeah, that's for ten, four twenty, four thirty something. Yeah, I was just getting it mixed up with the one on our paper because that one's going by twos. Okay, so let's get out a violet crayon here. Mm, I guess that's probably the closest. And that's 420, that's 440. So 430 would be right in the middle. So bam, we've done the hydrogen spectrum. The hydrogen spectrum is remarkably simple. It has one red line at 656, one blue line at 486, and one purple line at 434. Those are hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, and hydrogen gamma, which you learned about in your lecture today. These three photons are the most important photons in all of astronomy. Can you guess why? Guess what 90% of the universe is made out of? Hydrogen. Exactly. Guess what the other 28% is made out of? Deuterium. No. Helium. Helium. That's right. So let's go ahead and take a look at helium gas now. So I'm going to very carefully, hopefully this isn't too hot. E, 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 e. Okay. Don't want to burn myself. Uh, I think this is helium. Okay. So what do you guys notice about the color of heated up helium gas? It's orange. Yeah. Do you guys know how this works? That tube there is basically a gun that fires electrons. And this is a very, very low density helium gas. So the helium atoms are all floating around in there. The electrons are shooting through the tube and they're smashing into the helium. And as the electrons hit the helium gas, they heat up the helium and kick the electrons to higher orbits. As the electrons fall back down, they begin to glow. Okay, let's see if we can't look at the helium spectrum with our spectrograph here. I'm gonna try this sideways and see if this helps at all. Uh, nope, that's not gonna work. Okay. What the fudge? Why do you have your stupid I just turned you off. Those are pretty good. If I make it too bright, I'll have trouble focusing, you know? Sorry, right, this is tough. All right, well, let's see what I got here. That's actually not too shabby. That's pretty clear. Okay, let's start with the red yeah. line. What's the red line at, students? Your job is to read the graph. That's a you job. Six sixty-two. Um, six. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Right, right after six sixty. Okay. So here's helium. 620, 640, just after 660. Hey, by the way, it's, you know, it looks, the CCD makes it look a funny color, but when I would do this lab in person, it was really funny to watch people get their colors mixed up. Um, usually like the, I consider this to be yellow, but usually the male students would say it's orange and the female students would say it's yellow, although people went back and forth. Um, it certainly looks kind of yellowish here, although it's kind of a golden. Here it looks a little more orange. What's the wavelength, guys? Six sixteen. No, false. That's reading it backwards. 
584. I don't understand. My mouse is suddenly not working. That is so weird. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm having like a sep. Sorry, can you say that again, Wyatt? Uh, 584 nanometers. 50, 60, 70. It, yeah, totally agree with that. So let's get out a golden yellow color. Maybe like, hmm, maybe that one. I saw this the other day at Job Lot when I was just buying random shit. Because as you know, you never go into job lot with the intention of getting anything in particular. Um, and, and I knew this was going to come in handy for our lab today. Okay, so I'm sorry, Wyatt, what was that again? It was 580 something, 584? 84. 84, 85 words. So somewhere around here. You guys with me? Is there also I looked I looked it up and it says that it's just on the cusp of being yellow. Like nice. five eight it's yellow is five fifty to five eighty nanometers. Um I would say that five fifty is kind of greenish. We'll we'll see this in a second. Yeah. You'd be surprised, but why it yellow, the perception of yellow is a really obnoxiously narrow range of wavelengths. Like yeah, because it's not like it it's not intuitive because you usually think in like paint colors. Right, right. But when you actually, you'll see, part of the issue here is that my CCD camera on my phone, it, it doesn't have the same quality of color discrimination as your eye does. It's a little bit more artificial. But when I look through the spectroscope at, I, it looks to me like yellow is like a really narrow range that starts around like 570 or even sometimes 575. And yellow seems to kind of end off around 585. And then, yeah, around 585, it starts to kind of turn orangey. So the perception of yellow is a really narrow range of wavelengths. Whereas, Wyatt, if you think about red, red kind of begins at like 620, and it goes all the way to 700. Yeah. Another way to think about it is at the edge of the spectrum, we don't have as many cool names for shades of red as we do for all the small changes in colors in the middle because our eye is more sensitive to discriminating color. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, um, enough yapping here. So we got a couple of greens. We got a green at 500 and we got a green at 490. So let's, let's bust out a couple of greens here, kind of like a foresty green. I'm gonna put it on my, all right. So 500. And just before that at 490, maybe if I want to get really jazzy, wait a minute, is that really 490? Wow, there they look almost tealish, right? Yeah, that color didn't come out yeah. right, but short of 500, it really starts to get kind of a tealish color. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix, I'm going to get real fancy because I like to do that. I'm going to mix green and I'm gonna overlay a touch of blue on it to get a kind of tealish color. <laughs> you can barely even notice it, but it's there. Um, and then we even got a violet in there, don't we? Ooh. Ooh, it almost looks like we have an indigo and then we have a violet. What's the wavelength of the indigo? I would say 469. Yeah, 450. Yeah, 469. So let's get out our indigo here. Here's a beautiful dark indigo. 469. And then we got a violet at 445. Professor, I have a question. Yes, sir. So on 5,000, 
what are those two colors? What is the color on 5,000? What is the color next to it on the left? Sure. The color on 5,000, I chose a dark green. Dark green. The color next to it, you can just use green, or if you want to get super fancy, you could use a kind of te a dark teal. So okay. this is dark teal. By the way, I, I would say just two greens is okay. We don't have to go super nutty. I'm kind of getting into it because when I do something, I like to get into it, you know? So I'm discriminating between indigo and violet, but you can just put two greens and you can put a couple of purples there if you want, okay? What's important is I don't want to see any red over here or that will tick me off, you know? Okay, helium's done. Let's move on to mercury. Oh, shoot. That's going to be wicked, wicked hot. Okay, hold on a second while I get uh, an oven mitt. I should not have left that on. It's going to be very, very hot. Okay. Um, what do we got next? Mercury. Okay. Ooh, a cool blue color. I had it. Sorry, guys. One sec. If only I had just one more hand, this would be a lot easier. I've got some contamination from the window there that's really messing me up. You can even see there's some faint reds in there. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Ah. Oh. This is driving me nuts. All right, in the interest of time, we're just going to go with one of those. That's actually kind of a yellow in there. So let's do the yellow at 550, 60, 70. So there's a yellow at 570. So here's 570. Let's put the yellow in. Okay. We got a really potent green at 545. That's the classic mercury line, that 545 line. We have an indigo at four. What would you guys say the indigo line is at? Which one is the indigo line? Do you know what color indigo is, Caitlin? It's a like bluish purple color. I just see green. You don't see my indigo here? Can you see my mouse? Yeah. I just did you see what I just circled? 
my like little camera thingy was in front of that. My bad. Sorry. Okay. What would you say, Caitlin? Four thirty. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Okay. I thought I even saw some purples in there. You know what? There's a couple of others in there. There's some faint reds and there's some other faint purples, but let's, we'll just do the brightest of them, okay? I'm going to let you leave that in the interest of time for Mercury. There's a couple others in there, but I had a, oh shoot, I keep forgetting to shut this off. Okay. Let's try neon. Um, where is the neon? Hold on a second. Mercury, Mercury, Mercury. Helium. Neon. What color do you think this is going to be when I flip it on, students? Red. Purple. Ever seen a Michelob sign before? Red, red. Well, neon's certainly not dim. That's good about it. Hold on. Uh, lots of reds. Yeah, lots and lots of reds. Did you do this before in uh, high school class, Wyatt? I have. Also, you showed us a picture of Neon earlier. Are you saying you remember stuff from my lecture? I do. When you show us neat pictures. I try. Luckily, it's a cool subject. That's pretty, oh, sorry. That's pretty, that one's pretty solid, right? There's actually more red lines than that even, but we're, we're running out of time, so I want to do this here. Okay, so let's be quantitative about this. Ooh, don't forget to turn the light off. Yeah, I just did that. Um, Good job, How many Kevin. red lines? It looks like I can see from, from 650 to 660, 650 to 670, I can see one, two, three lines. Yeah, Professor, I can't get that specific on MS Paint. It's just tough with the trackpad. Do what you can, baby. Do what you can. So there's Alrighty. I'm going to do one, two, three. And I made those between 650 and 670. There's actually two faint ones out here, but my CCD didn't pick them up. You can usually pick them up with your eyeball. Okay, it looks like from... So those photons that you see, these ones around 600 are kind of orangey or kind of blood orange. But we've got one, two, three, four, five between 650 and 620. So I'm going to do one, two, three, four, five. Then I'm going to start drawing in some orangey ones. Some around 620, one, two, three, four oranges, maybe. I haven't used orange yet, so let's put on the orange crayon. So we're just going to kind of wing it here. One, two, three, four. And I've got some yellows as well. How many yellows would you say I have, students? Two. 
two. Maybe three. It depends on which photograph you take. Let's go with three to be safe. So that's sort of the spectrum of neon. I've done that better before, but. <clears throat> All right, let's give our incandescent a whirl here. Uh, I'm gonna try this dimmer bulb. This guy's only 40 watts. That one's 120. So you guys know what we're going to see when we do the uh, the, uh, the incandescent bulb, right? Uh Rainbow, right? Exactly. But our job will be to get the order of the colors as correct as possible, which if you paid attention, Wyatt, you'll already have a sense of where they are. But part of the fun of a lab is to see it with your own eyes. Seeing is believing, you know what I mean? Yes. Okay. Um, let's see if I can do this. Unfortunately, the CCD cam, I have an iPhone 5 and the camera kind of sucks in the iPhone 5. So this is not going to be easy to do this. Uh, but I will, I will guide you. The trick is to get it bright enough so that you can see the wavelengths and the colors, but not so bright that it washes out. Uh, why is it split? Oh, it's because. Hold on. Just let me wiggle for a second here. All right, we're going with one of those. We can kind of work with this. So it goes from violet at 400. Um, although my CC didn't pick it up very well, it turns kind of indigo around 450. I always think of 450 as being indigo. Then it goes kind of uh, cyan sky blue up to 500. 500 starts turning green. Notice why it that the yellows is actually a pretty narrow. Did I get any decent? Yeah, these pictures came out kind of rough. Yellow goes from like, let's see, that's 550, 560. Yellow is from like 570 to like 580 or 90 or something. Here's how I usually draw the visible continuous spectrum. So I'm going to do this. Let me get my holder boulder. And let's go sideways for you guys here. So this is the incandescent spectrum. So I'll start off with violet and violet starts off around uh, 400. And it stays violet in a smooth continuous band roughly up to you get to like 440 or so. And then 440 it starts to transition into an indigo Indigo goes from 440 through 450 up to about 460. After 460, it starts to turn a sort of cyan or skyish blue. Right at 500, it tends to kind of transition over to green. I'll do a couple of different shades of green. So first I'll do kind of, actually, no, I should do a dark green first. Ah, I should do a kind of dark green. And then somewhere after 530, it should start to become a kind of brighter, brighter green. We don't have as many discriminating colors for green. I don't know why that is. Um, and then around 570 or 580, 
that's where it starts becoming yellowish. So I'm going to go from just 560 to 580 or so will be yellow. And then just before 600, it starts to turn orange. And orange kind of goes past 600, almost up to 620. That's when it just gets really red. That, that, my friends, is the incandescent spectrum. That's the visible continuous spectrum. That is not an emission line spectrum. Take a moment to get that right. That actually came out pretty good. Okay. Time to look at the solar spectrum. Now, let's see what we got outside. Do you guys see how it's a, it's a white cloudy day out there? Yeah. And it's actually perfect. It's perfect for looking at the solar spectrum. You might think that I'd actually need the sun, but I don't need the sun. What I need is a patch of white cloud because the, the sunlight is what's illuminating the white cloud. And even though the white cloud is scattered sunlight, even scattered sunlight perfectly preserves the spectrum. So um, let me see if I can turn my camera sideways so you guys can see what I'm doing here as I'm doing it. So the, the webcam will show you what I'm up to. I'm going to try to look at the solar spectrum. Can you guys hear me OK if I'm standing over here? Yeah. I'm going to try to point it at some white cloud. If I had a newer iPhone, this would be, oh, I have to get a better phone for this lab. This lab. Uh, This is always tough. So what's your first impression, your first take about this? What are the hot takes? Um, the, the three main colors of light, like blue, green, and red are showing up very more prominently than in the incandescent bulb. Well, unfortunately it should be similar to the incandescent bulb. The problem is that the, the, it's a, it's an artifact of the way this camera works, uh, Wyatt. This okay. camera uses something called a bear matrix. So in order to reproduce color, it has a black and white camera. And then it has three little pieces of glass, a red piece of glass, a blue glass, and a green glass. And it's blending them together. But because All it's right. blending them together, it kind of awkwardly overemphasizes the blue, green, red. Like you're not seeing as much fine color discrimination. But what I want, so this should be a rainbow, Wyatt, but I'm talking about this thing right here. Uh, can I, my mouse no longer, my, I have to use the trackpad now. There's something going on in here. 
It's happening right there. Can you see that? I see the line. Yeah. So unfortunately, my camera isn't good enough to pick them up. I'd need a better spectroscope. But the way this should look, uh, if I stop share, am I going to be able to reshare again? This should look, can you guys see my screen? Yep. OK. Um, With a slightly better camera and a slightly better spectroscope, what you see instead is this. Is it more prominently green? No, something different. This is what oh. we should. What is all that? Yeah, really good question. This is known as the Fraunhofer absorption spectrum, first discovered by Joseph Fraunhofer in the 1800s. What this is, is these are all dark absorption lines. And the reason why there is so many in the solar spectrum is because the sun, although it's mostly hydrogen and helium, it contains basically little bits of every single element in the periodic table. Just like if you dig around in Earth's crust enough, you'll find almost every type of element from uranium to boron. By floating around in the sun's atmosphere are, are small amounts of all these different elements. Now, all these different elements each have a unique absorption line spectrum. These are absorption lines, and they're being produced in the atmosphere of the sun. When electrons jump from low to high orbit, they absorb certain photons from the visible spectrum. By studying these absorption lines, this is how astronomers know what the chemical composition of the sun is without ever having to go there. Do you see how some of the lines are dark and broad and other ones are faint and narrow? You can actually learn details of the physics by studying the width or the depth of those lines. So here's how we're going to. So, yeah, question. Is there on that picture that you just showed green was like, like there was a lot of green on that spectrum. Was there a reason for that? Or is that just like that another is a, is a better representation than the one we did. So let's see, let's look at their range once again and see how theirs corresponds to ours, because ours should have looked like that. Um, oh, they don't have this calibrated. That's one of the issues. Um, this, this graph, uh, Wyatt, has a very high dispersion. Dispersion is the term that we use when we're talking about how, how spread out the wavelengths are. The reason yeah. why it looks there's like there's a lot of green is this photograph is just the rainbow is really, really stretched out. So you get okay. lots and lots of detail. Do you see what I mean? And it's just like a snippet of that from the middle. Well, they've got some blue in there too. And they've got some red in there too, but it's just not calibrated. This needs to be calibrated okay. like ours is. So, so ours is a little bit squished. Theirs is a bit more stretched out. Why don't we start by just kind of reproducing the, the incandescent spectrum because it should be the same. I'm just having an awkward day here. I'm just not very smooth today. Okay. Um, let's grab purple. Purple goes from 400 to 440. Indigo from 440 to 460. This is the cartoon version. Cyan from 460 to 500. Uh, wait, can you guys see what I'm doing here? Oh, I'm not sideways. Hold on. Uh, this is not a good lab for my mouse to die on because I have to use the trackpad and it's very inelegant. Now you guys are like buried behind all my other windows. All right, there you are. Uh, there we go. 
Sorry, guys. Okay, green, 500 to maybe 580. And then yellow, five, 560 to 580. Orange, 580 to 620 and then red all the way out. Now, when I do this with students in the lab, you guys can easily see the dark absorption lines with your eyes in the cheap spectroscope that I'm using here. Unfortunately, um, the lines didn't really come out today in my spectroscope. So what we're gonna do here, woo, trippy is we're gonna kind of grab a few of the dark lines from this solar spectrum. So it looks like we can see quite a few in the green. There are some dark ones in the blood orange section and a few in the yellow. So go ahead and find yourself a, a number two pencil. I don't know where mine is. Okay. And let's just draw in a few of those dark absorption lines. I would like them to be a little more technical than this, but we're sort of running out of time. It's important to understand that this is an absorption line spectrum. This is not, this is not um, a continuous spectrum. It's an absorption line spectrum. So what we're doing is we're drawing in a few of the dark absorption lines. A very high resolution spectroscope will find thousands upon thousands of lines buried inside there. Okay. And that's our lab. Sorry, it took a little bit longer than average because I was, it, it's difficult to fiddle with the equipment here. You guys got that? I think so. I'm going to stop this here. Professor, I'm going to have to submit and see what you think because it's a little, Can it's you, weird. Wait, if MS. I give you permission to share screen, can you share? Because you're doing it digitally, right? Yeah, I also did it on paint. I, I can show yeah, yeah, I can show you. Bless I you. See. I don't know what the hell is wrong with me today. Yo. Professor, the main reason I was asking about like the green specifically was because I, um, I was watching a video a while back on the reason that like plants and stuff are green. Yep. And so essentially the reason what it comes down to is they are like, they evolved to so perfectly or whatever that um, they tried to find like what color from the sun is most consistent year round because not all light from the sun is like, you get the same amount of it all the time. And so what they found is that from our sun, green is the most consistent like color that gets shown down on earth. So um, plants just being smarter. Why is, if only we had gone further earth. in our lecture today, cause I'm gonna cover this very issue uh, on Thursday, but let me, let yeah. me clarify a couple of things here. The sun pumps out a lot of visible light, but the sun puts out a little bit more green than any other color. So actually it's not very efficient for plants to look green because that means they're backscattering and losing the brightest wavelength of light of the sun. The reason why plants are green is because of the size of the chloroplast inside of their cells. It turns yeah. out that what makes something one color versus another color is microscopic bumps have different sizes and, and, and different sizes or different grains will backscatter different light. Now, if you think about it, Wyatt, if a plant is green, that means it absorbs all the colors except for green. So plants absorb purple and indigo and blue and yellow and orange and red. But it turns out that if you measure the wavelengths that the sun emits, the sun emits more green than all of those other colors. So that's not an efficiency on the plant's part. 
that's a detriment. They're, hmm. they're getting rid of some of the most abundant photons that are bouncing around. It turns out that the chloroplasts which absorb these colors have a certain optical properties which backscatter green light. The reason why it's okay is because it's just one color out of the entire rainbow. So they're still absorbing lots and lots of photons. It would be much huh. worse if they were multicolored, you know? If they were white, they'd be really screwed because then they would scatter every color. Yeah. Leaves, do you know what they would have to be to be the optimum color? Black. Yeah. Then they would well, but see, that's what it was talking about. The, the video was actually saying that black isn't the most efficient, is what they're saying. Or like, it was, it was talking about why plants aren't black. Well, whatever biologist made that program should have taken my class. Because <laughs> I, I'm telling you, if, if plants were black, well, it, the goal of a, we're assuming there's a magical universe where plants can be any color they want. If they want to absorb the maximum amount of light, they would need to be black. However, well, unfortunately, nature requires them to be made out of some real non-magical substance. And that magical substance is leaves. And the things that absorb the photons, I believe, aren't they called chloroplasts? They are. But see, this is they were talking about why like chloroplasts, chloroplasts evolved to um, uh, reflect the green uh, wavelength rather than other colors, rather than black, if, you, if that makes sense. So why chloroplasts are green? Um, well, there is a reason for that, but you know what? One of the things, I wish I could find this, uh, tech, this picture in my physics textbook. I wonder if I have it on my shelf back there. There, there was a picture in my physics textbook that just blew my mind. Um, it turns out that light backscatters colors that are about the same size as their wavelength. So it was, this, it was this compound from the periodic table, like it was selenium and had been put into a powdered form. And what the scientist has done is they had made two samples of this, this powder. I can't remember if it was selenium or what it was. In one case, the grains were about 700 nanometers. And in the other case, the grains were about 600 nanometers. And the grains that were a little bigger, that were 600 nanometers, when they backscattered light, it looked red. And when the grains that were smaller backscattered light, it looked yellow. So keep in mind, this powder is made of the same exact chemical element, something like selenium or something like that. Or, or I don't know what it was now. But all they had done was change the diameter of the little grains of sand, and it totally changed the color. Huh. Now, there are reasons why chloroplasts might absorb light, but I suspect that the reason that they backscatter green light has to do with the diameter of those cellular structures. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. I don't, so when you say, plants can certainly evolve to, I, I'm evolution is a part of because, this process, but because it's not. Because the way that it was, but like they could evolve a mutation that like changes the diameter of, of their um, chloroplast and, or of that light refracting chloroplast. And then if that color you know what I mean? Because evolution works with uh, mutations and stuff. So if, you, if it mutates and the mutation is successful, then that would be passed on. Right. But the only thing that scares me right? about so if that, somebody mutated to be black, I don't think you then can that black... Chemical, I don't think you can mutate the chemical composition of chloroplast or it won't be chloroplast anymore. So it's not obvious to me what part evolution plays and what but, part chemistry plays. But the part that makes the color we are talking about is a physical property. And those physical properties can be changed through mutations, I believe. No, here's an example, Wyatt. Oh yeah, bye, Kevin. That's okay. Wyatt, what about sodium? Have a good day. What about salt, sodium chloride? You can't evolve sodium chloride to be a different chemical size or start. Do you know what I mean? Well, but salt isn't. But salt isn't uh, like, and like a, a biological thing. Like chloroplasts are a biological like cell like chloroplasts are a cell made up of a bunch of smaller uh, substructures, right? And that specific thing, because uh, genes have to code for making the chloroplasts. I've got to right? say, your why, body, they're the... Why, you, you've got me thinking. I'm not sure. Here's the question that we have to look up and one of us has to find. Yeah. We have to figure out if cells could could change the diameter of their chloroplasts. I I suspect the answer is but, no. I don't know everything. 
I'll totally look into that and I'll get back to you next class. All right, you find out and I'll, I'll do some reading too, okay? Oh yeah, okay. Arunsak, I can check your submission. Hold on, let me stop the recording for the sake of the people later. Uh, everyone watching later, submit your stuff. Bye-bye.